Welcome to the Overcoming Adversity Podcast, where it's all about a transformational growth and having a resilient mindset. Before we get started, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. I'm your host, Michael Allison. Today, we have on the show Mr. Derek Newborn. He is a life optimization coach. He was named one of Florida's top personal trainers and also the creator of the Newborn Blueprint. He has experienced his own fair share of adversities in his life, and he's here to talk about it today. Let's welcome to the show my really good friend, Mr. Derek Newborn. How's it going, man? Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Excited I'm to be here. <laughs> Can't I'm wait. Good, man. Thank you so much for joining me and being here, man. Uh, I love the fact that you're down here in South Florida. Uh, we Florida <laughs> boys. That's right. So if I ever if I ever need you or need to contact you about something, you just up the street from me, man. So I really like that, man. That's right, hundred percent. Man, all right. So we were speaking backstage, brother, and um, you have an extremely fascinating story. You know, you're a guy that's in the uh, fitness space and listed as one of the uh, top personal trainers. And I know that comes with a level of I w- would say like you know whenever I see guys like bodybuilding, lifting the weights, they kind of like macho guys cocky guys and they're like they really get full of themselves and stuff like that yeah and i know when we're speaking that you said that becoming this type of person it led to a uh a, a phase in your life where it was like self-destructive behavior oh, yeah. and um some things around like narcissism and for our audience that's listening you know this is an extremely extremely important topic as Lots of I I usually hear this topic around women Mm -hmm. and they say they deal with men that are narcissists and things like that around that topic, you know. So yeah, yeah. I wanted you to like let's dive into your story, a little bit of your path, your journey around some of this topic and things, man. So if you can, man, let's talk about like how did how did you fall into this and how did you um deal with it while you were going through it? Yeah, so um so number one, uh, mental health and depression runs on both sides of my family in many, many ways. I never thought too much about it. So I went about life, um, became a successful personal trainer and grew that. And then from there, um, got discovered, became a full time uh, fitness model and everything that that entails. Right. You got to look a certain way all the time. Right. There's a lot of attention from people, a lot of attention from females, all that, all that, 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 that kind of life, that cliche life. Um, and as I was getting more and more successful and in my mind, living out my exact dream, I always wanted to make a living in the fitness, um, space and I was doing it. I used to, you know, lay in bed and just think about how cool it would be just to get paid for somebody to take a picture of you. Right. And I was, I was living that. Right. I was also, I had, you know, a girlfriend and another thing that, you know, she was the girl that I dreamed of before I even met her. We were in a serious relationship, living together, the whole deal. Um, And the more successful I was getting with everything I thought that I wanted, the more self-destructive I was becoming. So the more self-absorbed, the more cheating and hurting her directly, the more um, I found myself just using essentially everybody in my life for my own own um, purposeful gain. Um, but the whole time, every time I cheated or every time I got, you know, something from somebody that I wanted, I never felt like it didn't feel good. It was never like, oh, great. I'm so glad I did that. I always felt even worse Mm -hmm. and I couldn't figure out. So I was kind of stuck in this cycle um, until, right, eventually people, they're only going to take so much before everything, everything implodes. Right. Um, So it got to that point where, you know, everybody, everybody essentially walked away. They had enough of Derek's craziness, right. And and self absorption. Um, And that really magnified, depression that I had been hiding. So the depression was why I was always feeling so low about myself. Feeling so low about myself, I constantly just grabbed at whatever attention I could get, assuming that would make me feel better and make me feel um, a different way inside. It didn't. felt like two different people. This people, this person that everybody saw on the outside who had everything going for him, and then this other person that literally just hated himself and felt so empty. 
So wow. obviously when everything, you know, when everybody walked away, that led to even more depression, heavy, heavy, heavy depression. And the more I tried to get people back in my life and, you know, they, they weren't ready for all that, the deeper my depression got, got to the point of, of rock bottom that led to, um, suicide attempts, two different suicide attempts. And at that, at that stage, once I made it through the suicide attempts, thank God, I had to look around and essentially look in the mirror and realize the only common denominator in all my troubles was me. Mm -hmm. Right. So that took a lot to absorb, but being able to take ownership that I was the common denominator of everything that's transpired in my life also made me realize that from that point on, I'm the common denominator of everything that transpires in my life. So essentially I can choose where I go from here. Now, do I continue finding new victims and just stay on that path or do I remember the person that I was before all of this and the people that I love? And that's what I chose. So I started building from back, from rock bottom, starting with extreme ownership of every single thing that I've done to every single person. And then I can start building, building myself from there. And then slowly I've worked up and now that's what essentially I help other people. Number one, avoid um, rock bottom. So they have a place to go if they're successful, but they're struggling in their personal life. And then I also help the other side of people, essentially women that have had are dealing with men that I used to be. Mm -hmm. So that way I, I, right now I'm helping both sides heal. Derek, man, um, your story is one of, uh, truly, truly overcoming adversity and developing that resilient mindset. And bro, what I, what I loved about your story is, is the self-awareness, man. Um, knowing yeah. that there is an origin to this and I need to find it, fix it, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, pre prescribe a prescription for myself in regards to like getting out of this. Yeah. I, I, I want to unpack that a little bit, man. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't take uh, mental health lightly. I don't take suicide lightly. I've been there myself. You know, the suicide rates are at an, an alarming rate in mm -hmm. this day and age, you know? Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, at the beginning of your story, talking about wanting to be like in the limelight and, kind of got to you and things like that. And you slowly but surely found people falling by the wayside and not going in the same path in the direction that you thought you wanted to going or you want you were going in. Yeah. And then kind of like losing your identity when you came back home. Because when you came back home, it was that's not really me. That's not who I wanted to be. Yeah. And, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, um so, so essentially, um, you know what, once I, once I decided I was going to take ownership and build from there, uh -huh. like you said, I literally had to unpack my life in re reverse order. And the more work I did, the more I realized. So essentially what transpired in my life growing up, you know, there was so much abandonment in my, in my life from the people that I love the most, you know, my father, um, going to prison, I was seven, my parents divorced. Now being raised by a single mom who she's doing the best she can. So that means, you know, I'm sleeping outside the gate of the school before the sun comes up, all, all that stuff, um, all the way up through in my early twenties where I was married and came home and my wife had taken everything. And that was, that was it. So I constantly was shown that the people I care about the most, no matter what you do, they'll leave you in a second, right? That was imprinted on my mind. So once I got to that point of having attention and having my girlfriend that I loved, having, you know, people by my side, it was already subconsciously imprinted that these people are going to leave me. Yeah. I'm never going to be abandoned again. So 
I'm going to have this woman on the side because I know that she's going to leave. Right. Or yeah. these people are my friends right now. I need to get what I can from them because I know they're not going to last forever. And same with family members. So my greatest fear of abandonment is essentially what I ended up creating for myself at the end because everybody left. And that's what we don't realize is, is we experience so much trauma early on. It starts to show up towards later on and later on in life. But once I had that discovery, I can be like, okay, you know, it doesn't make excuses for my actions, but now I can start to work with, you know, what I'm actually feeling, what I'm, what I'm dealing with. And that, that was huge when it came to ownership. I, I think it's extremely important with the, uh, taking extreme ownership and responsibility for all of our actions. I think um, many times we play the blame game. And when we play that blame game, that baggage just keeps carrying with us, carrying with us, carrying with us all the way to the next relationship, the next friendship into our lives. And yeah. it's so imperative that you recognize that. Can you talk a little bit, Derek, about as you was on this journey, mm -hmm. right? What lessons did you learn about yourself in regards to the abandonment in, regard, in addition to some of the, what you spoke about? What, what are some like key lessons that you learned that some of our audience could take away that could be going through an experience like this, maybe treating a woman like this or a woman that could be in a relationship like this? What are some key lessons that you could share at this early phase as we continue this conversation? Yeah. So the, the best lesson I learned is, you know, for all of us up until this point right now, we've all done the best we can with the tools we've been given in life. Mm -hmm. Right. So any terrible thing I did at the end of the day, I thought I was protecting myself. All right. Right. If a woman is dealing with this type of man, she's doing the same thing. She's operating with the, the best knowledge and tools that she has. So if she's enabling them, she's not trying to enable them. She's trying to protect herself and do what she think is best. So once you realize, you know, up until this exact point, you've done what the best you could up to this point. But that doesn't mean it has to keep going that way. Today can start a whole, whole new day. And if you know where that protection version of yourself, right? Mine was a narcissist. If you know where that is created, you can go back to there and start reverse engineering your life to this point. I, I find often that either a man or a woman will attract themselves to something that they lacked as a child. So yes. if you were to date a woman, she, she might find in you something that she lacked in her dad yes. or something yes. of that magnitude. And yeah. you yeah. as a man is going to attract a woman for something that you like. And I noticed for, your, for the example that you gave, you had spoken about a, an abandonment. And whenever I talk to women, right, they, they often say that they, they were missing this piece from their dad. So they'll find this at maybe their preteen age. And then during their teenage age, they find this type of person. And then once it's time to get married or get into a relationship, they get into, they find this type of husband. And it also correlates to with maybe the profession or the career that they go after. You know what I mean? As you spoke about, you found the career that gave you the attention. You found the career that that you got all of the limelight and things like that. Can you yeah. talk about once you was in this career and in this profession, how did your life transform? And then when did you notice the change and then when did you notice when your friends says you know what this is not the same Derek that we grew up with this is not the same guy that i fell in love with what was yeah. that like yeah well like to, to your point so like aside from the abandonment issues i also grew up as a um only child mm -hmm. so um i didn't i didn't i didn't have that many friends i wasn't social so again that career that i took on was really what I was, you know, I, I'd never experienced before. Right. And, um, so once it, once it got going, you know, again, I had been this person that didn't, that was starving for attention essentially. Right. And then 
So once I get a successful personal training business, the last thing I'm going to do is slow down or be, um, or take a break. And then once I get thrust into the modeling line, by same thing, I'm going to keep growing as fast as I can do everything possible. And I think, you know, subconsciously I was saying my girlfriend, these friends, these clients, they were not there when I was a child. So right now I'm the most important thing. So you guys just have to deal with it. You can either go along with my stuff or not. Right. Cause I had that, I had that ego going and, you know, I think at first everybody's like, congratulations. We're proud of you. We said, su we support you. But then something changes when like, I'll tell you, something changed when my mom had to move from um move to a new house mm -hmm. and i was so worried about my body fat that i told her i couldn't help her wow and at that wow. time i thought i thought nothing of it no mom i can't i can't do that because i don't want to mess up any mess wow. up somebody fat. it's embarrassing right but that that's the level of that I that I was at. Wow. And, you know, and obviously me, me and my mom are are great now, but that happened in every aspect of my life. And I thought, hey, you should go along with this. Look what I'm doing. Like, <laughs> can't you see all this attention? Can't you see my picture in these magazines? Can't you see you guys should be right. And then people are like, you know, I didn't I didn't sign up for this, Derek, like. That, that's not, that's not yeah. why I'm friends with you, right? That's not, I didn't start dating you because you were a model. I knew you way before that because you're a completely different person, you know? And just like you said, you know, my girlfriend at the time, she lacked certain things with her father's stuff. So she was always trying to fix our situation to keep our situation in good. And really all that did was enable me and show me that, what I was doing was acceptable and I can get away. Yeah. With it, yeah right. Yeah. And so that just, that just added to the tornado and enforced it. So yeah, you're definitely right about the partner thing. I wanted to, so you didn't grow up with brothers and sisters. So having that experience with your dad and your mom as a young kid, can you talk a little bit about like your upbringing? So what was it like going through this as a kid, right? And you're seeing this visually with your eyes and mentally, emotionally, you're, you're going through these experiences. I want to ask you, what was that like with that feeling that you talk about with like abandonment and nobody's around and then going to school, having friends, yeah. engaging with people, engaging with your teachers and things like that. Did that pour out into those situations, knowing what was going on with you at home? Yeah, it, it affected so many things. Um, so like I said, you know, I still remember I got sat down on the living room floor. I was told my dad's going away to prison. Nothing, I, nothing I can do about it. Right. right. Um, and then, like I said, so that led, you know, my parents, they they were great parents. They did the absolute best they could. But my mom was in a situation that she has to put food on the table. Right. So, like I said, she would drop me off at like 4 a.m. and I would just sleep by the gate and the maintenance man would have to let me in now. I was a child with the father that is in prison, right? So no kid really wanted to hang out with me, right? Mm -hmm. Teachers treated me a little differently, mm -hmm. right? So that just drastically affected. I didn't have, I didn't hang out with people on the weekends. I went home and hung out by myself, right? Um, so all those things, and even into, even into high school, the same thing. I went to a completely different high school where I didn't know anybody and the same thing new kids very hard to make make friends etc um so all these things just literally just kept shaping and isolating me and all the way up and during those um years of my mom being single she would also she would try to date men right and there was one new year's eve we came home and the only thing left was a microwave in our house and then, so again, I was just, I was just, I just kept being shown that everything can be gone in a minute. And then, like I said, then I, it happened to me with my divorce with my ex-wife. It was the same exact scenario, just 
a few years later. So really, how could I not believe that abandonment is real? Wow, 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 bro. Um, I grew up with a, a mom and dad, so I can't imagine um, that experience. And for me to think of like, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely sensitive when it comes to uh, how kids are treated based off what I kind of told you with my experience outside yeah. of my household and stuff like that. But to be left at a gate, waiting for the school gates to open and stuff like that, um, that's, that's extremely scary, bro. Man, I uh, I applaud you, bro, for coming on here and sharing your story once again, man. Yeah, and I wanted to touch on this uh, serious topic, man. So going through what you were going through, it led you to the path of two suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. And that tells me that you were in a serious depression, dark space, and... And about to give up on yourself, you know, man. So if you can talk, talk to our audience about what that was like when you was going through that. And mm -hmm. what was that pivotal moment what, what, that you said, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to change my life and, and I'm going to go into a different direction. Well, um, really, the only thing that stopped the second attempt was my mom just happened to show up in the middle of it. Wow. So. What I can tell you for anybody that's listening and dealing with that is, you know, I, I know that I wanted to kill that past version of myself. Mm -hmm. The only way I could comprehend that was to physically end my life. Mm -hmm. There's other ways you can end that painful version of your life. But you can't see that at the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I, I was I went to therapists. I've been in mental hospitals and they always ask you, do you feel like hurting yourself? Right. All right. Nobody wants to hurt themselves. They want to end the pain that they're feeling. They don't right. want to physically right. hurt themselves. Right. Right? Right. right. You're right. You're right. And if I just had somebody I could say, hey, that pain we can get rid of that you're feeling without the actual physical physical aspect. So, like I said, the second attempt was just God's grace that my mom mom showed up, you know. Um, and then a after after that is when I just started slowly repairing myself and I had to acknowledge now that that's a real thing. Like I've experienced it as close as you can. So you have to, you have to deal with that, right? You have to acknowledge it. You can't pretend it doesn't exist. You have to acknowledge that there's pain. You have to acknowledge that that's, that's real. So you have to stay mindful of yourself at all, all times. And that starts changing how you live. It starts changing how you interact in public. It starts changing what you watch on TV, right? It's, changes every aspect of your life so let's dive deeper into that as we uh transition um to your story here what was that transitional moment for you so once your mom stopped it thank god that happened right and what did you what, what are some things that you started employing into your life that's saying all right i'm going to start doing this i'm going to start doing that and how long was that process for you? Was it a couple months? Was it a couple years? In regards to you putting all these things into your life, all of these things to change your life, to change your mindset, to change uh, how, you, how your outlook on life is, how your outlook on your career is going to be now, and your relationships with your family and your friends and all those things. Uh, what was that process like for you? What were you doing? So the process was... It was around, it was, it was actually the day before Easter. So I had the second suicide attempt. And then the day before Easter came about. And like, I've never been that religious or that into, into church or anything. Mm -hmm. But essentially, I literally read the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. How he was physically dead and came back. 
and it literally did something inside of me and said you can resurrect from this version that version of derek is dead there's no doubt about that but you can resurrect and carry on this next next life because you're in control so that start so i literally had to start figuring out what works it started off with you know just self-medicating with pills and alcohol on my couch and just passing the time mm -hmm. to slowly going back out into the world and not feeling like a not feeling the shame and guilt 30 minutes at a, at a time to establishing a very specific morning routine that i still use to this day because i know for a fact the moment i wake up depression is there that's Real. just something that i live with depression is there there's darkness there i can feel it's heavy so i have a very um strict morning routine with positive affirmations cold shower journaling gratitude all that because that gives me a chance to stay on the path for the day. So you have to find what you can root yourself in that gives you the chance to stay on the right path. Because I know if I don't, it leads to dark thoughts. Because there's a, there a time before I had the morning routine where no exaggeration, my whole kitchen was covered in sticky notes and every sticky note had a um, statement about how shitty of a person I was. The whole thing was covered and like, again, that's real. So I have to, I started to align myself with routines, with the life coach, with the mentor to take it one day at a, one day at a time. doesn't mean every day is phenomenal, but you attach yourself to a routine. You start discovering what makes you happy again. So like I said, I went back to what did I enjoy as much as I can remember before my father went to prison because before that I had no sense of abandonment. So what are those things I enjoyed? Things like the outdoors, things like dogs, things yeah. like music. And I started to bring those things back into my life, walked away from the um, modeling and all, all that stuff, even walked away from social media for a while. And I just started trying to live as little Derek before my father was sent away. So Derek, how were you able to reconnect or did you, did you try to reconnect with all the people that when you got on that path that you disconnected with, did you try to reconnect and, and fix relationships back with your mom or get in contact with your dad or any relationships or women that you were dealing with and things like that. And I'm asking you that as I lead into the word forgiveness. And I know a lot of people, including myself, carried the baggage of um, unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. And that led to my world of destruction. So can you talk a little bit about unforgiveness? And then if you or you made an attempt to just make some reconnections into any relationship that you may have severed? Yeah, my I have a great relationship with my with my parents and my family. So reconnecting is probably not the best word. So once I took ownership and I was healing and understood, you know, my actions, then the biggest thing came self forgiveness. Mm -hmm. That was the hardest part for me. So the only way I knew how to start forgiving myself is go to the people that I hurt directly, mm -hmm. apologize face to face, explain, you know, my reasoning, essentially, no matter how much I loved you, which I did, I was more concerned about never being abandoned again. And that's why I did everything. And part of that ownership is realizing that those people have no responsibility to one, forgive you if they don't want to, two, sure. believe anything you say. Mm. So you have to make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons, right? You're doing it to release yourself. You're not doing it in hopes of getting them back in your life, even if that's what you want. If you have ownership, you have to realize that those people have no responsibility to you in any way, shape or form. So once I was able to overcome that hurdle and just like now, you know, I can sit on here and 
talk about my transformation. It doesn't mean anybody has to believe it, right? All right. So reconnecting is is something I think you can't even think about until you're firmly connected with yourself. Because if you're firmly connected with yourself, you can wish and prefer things, but you have to be connected to yourself even if nobody wants you in their life ever again. True. How, how did you come to the realization of identifying what what are like your anchors and things like that that kept you rooted? Because you spoke a lot about like your affirmations mm -hmm. and just like journaling and all these things that you were doing. How did you come to that, that realization that like this habit this practice is going to be extremely important to my success and my transformation. Yeah. The only, by trying, I've tried a lot of things that, that didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. um, like I tried, I tried going to church and at the end it didn't work out for me. Mm -hmm. I've tried medication at the end. It didn't work out for me. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, just not giving up on my self. So that's how I got to the, affirmations okay i can do this okay if i speak these affirmations i physically have to think about what i'm talking about mm -hmm. so like i said depression is there the moment i wake up so the moment i wake up i naturally want to find the darkness mm -hmm. but if i physically have to speak these positive affirmations at worst case scenario subconsciously they go through my head right True. best case scenario they change one thought in my morning and that one thought that changes changes an action of my day and that action could positively affect another human being absolutely so that's how i started is just trial trial and error once you if it doesn't work it's just one step closer to finding something that that does work absolutely so On your transformational journey, bro, you um, got into the space of now you're helping people because mm -hmm. you've been there, you walked it, you lived it, you've done it. Yeah. I want to dive into the newborn blueprint. And okay. if you could tell us what does that entail and what is that? What, what, tell us a little bit about your company and then just tell about the, um, the newborn um, uh, blueprint. Yeah. So I own um, Newborn Fitness, and that umbrella is the Newborn Blueprint. It, it um, um, covers my health and wellness coaching, health, fitness, metabolism, coaching, and all that stuff. So the Newborn Blueprint was created for men like me when I was in my prime of self-destruction. Mm -hmm. For the men who on the outside have success in every shape and form but are self-sabotaging themselves, whether it be the right. relationships, whatever it may be. Because I, I know that I had nowhere to turn. The moment I went to somebody and be like, bro, I am just messing up. They'd be like, you're crazy. What are you doing? Right? That's automatically somebody's response. Yeah. The more blueprint is created where you can come and say, bro, I'm doing A, B, and C. And I'm like, all right, let's, figure out what you actually want to be doing. I'm not here to remind you that you're messing up. Right. You know, so we have a lot of people where it's doctors or business executives that are very successful, but they're doing a lot of damage and it's mm. just a safe place that they can come and same, just like I did, we start unpacking everything. Okay. Right. You're doing this, which is fine. We know it's not beneficial. Let's figure out the root behind it. Let's not sit and talk about why you're cheating on your wife. Let's figure out what makes you cheat on your wife. And that's what the newborn blueprint is about. And that's why it was created. And then, like I said, it grew because a lot of people connect with my story. And, you know, on social media, I'm very transparent about narcissists, how they operate, all that stuff. So now it's also grown into the opposite side of the relationship where somebody's been with the narcissist somebody's been used and abused and now they need a place where they can come and start rebuilding and understanding really how they attributed to fueling the narcissist so they can rebuild 
let's talk about narcissists. If you can, man, tell us what is a narcissist, what person, what types of behavior that they would carry or act like. And then how does one avoid that? Mm -hmm. Or how does one get out of that, such as yourself? You know, because I think it's extremely important. I love the fact, like I told you, bro, I saw you uh, on social media and you were the first first person that just popped up <laughs> before this interview. But prior to that, I went and I checked out some of your other videos and I seen what you spoke said about your mom and how that impacted you on one of the posts that you made. Mm -hmm. I've seen what you spoke about these types of behaviors, but I think it's extremely important being someone that's lived it and done it to actually gives us, gives us some more insight around that. And I know that, bro, like I said, I've interviewed about three women that has been in relationship with narcissistic types of men. Sure. And, and they were attracted to them because of some things from their past. So mm -hmm. for yourself to hear it from, from a men's perspective, I think is, is extremely important. Okay. So you're asking what the traits of a narcissist? Yeah. So if you can talk about some, what are some of the traits of a narcissist um, type of person is. And yeah. how can one see that and avoid that type of person? Yeah. Um, so really what narcissists like to do is they like to love bomb at the beginning, right? Especially when it comes to a uh, female, right? They love bomb you and get you wrapped in close. Like this man is just crazy about me, right? Mm -hmm. And then slowly their actions and words start misaligning. Mm. So they might preach to other people and their friends and their family, how much they love this woman while also trying to get attention from other women or, you know, tell the woman, you know, let's do a, B and C create these grand plans and right. then never act on them. So essentially the actions are always rooted in keeping people attached to them. Mm -hmm. When they're attached to them then they can use them as needed so the more they the longer they stay attached the more fuel they provide the narcissist till eventually the people that are attached get completely drained and now they've lost themselves and then now they feel like they're the root of the problem so then they try to fix the relationship mm -hmm. which is why women end up in rough spots where they have to rebuild themselves and they don't you know they don't trust men they don't trust themselves it's because they were attached to a narcissist so long but they kept fueling the narcissist right just like in my situation if the first time i messed up if she would have said you're out i might have said okay so clearly i did something wrong right but when they say oh you know we'll we'll, we'll figure it out subconsciously narcissist like all right. Yeah, we will figure it out. We'll, I'll figure out how to not get caught next time. You know, is is really what, if I'm being honest, right. That's what. Oh man. So for someone that's a narcissist based off what you just explained, mm -hmm. it sounds like there is layers of covering things up, lying, all these different types of things. How does one keep up with all of these things in regards to like, because it sounds like you become like a master manipulator. Oh, yeah. It sounds yeah. Like yeah. I mean, master manipulator is a good, a good word. Like, let's just use myself as an example, right? All this attention, right? The only things I did were designed to make me seem like a great guy. Mm -hmm. Meaning... If I did help somebody out, everybody knew about it. So they could say what a great guy Derek is. I see. I see. Right. If it came to my relationship and I wanted to make it seem good, I would create elaborate event or vacation or something. Mm -hmm. And during that, you know, romance, wine and dine and all that stuff. And then once we got back to real life, just go back to the shittiness that it was right because mm -hmm. now she's all confused and then now she's questioning herself if she's questioning herself that takes the tension away from me and what i'm doing and then a narcissist will usually once they see that that their partner's questioning themselves 
they use that as manipulation. Then, you know, very little things you can blame on your partner because they're already questioning themselves. And then you'd be like, well, if you wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have did this. And then it turns into gaslighting and all that. Does that make sense? Perfect sense, man. Perfect sense. As, as you said that, I could only comprehend that this lead to mental illness on both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 100%. And, and um, because no one is winning, like everybody's getting hurt all around 360 here. Yeah. And, and I say that because whatever you share with this person, this person is extending or sharing it with another person, whatever you're telling them. Yeah. So they're making plans. They're making decisions. They're spending money. They're investing a whole bunch of things yeah. around these things to, yeah. to come to a point of potentially being duped. Yeah. And I know that could lead to a world of a whole bunch of stuff that could follow that. You know what I mean? And yeah, they, I've heard stories where it, where it went south and it went violent. You know what I mean? Yep. And I've, I've, I've heard it before from some people that I've talked to, interviewed. So how important now is someone that's listening to identify if they're in the situation to identify the seriousness around mental, mental, mental illness and getting help in this particular moment because you just clearly broke it down you clearly explained it so if someone is in a situation that you just talk about can you talk about how important mental illness is and identifying if they're with someone in a situation like this and what are some things that they could do yeah if you're if you're dealing with mental illness you have to speak up and that usually is the scariest thing to do but speaking up again will give you the just a small chance to change change the path if you stay in solitude with your thoughts nothing will change if you're somebody you know if you're on the other end of somebody with mental illness it's the same same aspect speak up for them so if because you know again if i didn't if i would have spoke up earlier before all the self-sabotage it could have been addressed during the self-sabotage if i would have spoke up about mental illness illness they would have seen that as an excuse me making excuses right because of all right. the damage that so if you're struggling with mental illness speak up send a message make a call whatever it may be reach out that's exactly why we have the newborn blueprint i'm sure they could reach out to you right if somebody just sends a message give yourself that opportunity and then go from there most definitely man i um uh, one percent agree with you you know like i said i, I take mental health um very serious as I've, I'm one that struggled with uh, depression, anxiety, suicide. But to hear your story and hear some of the examples that you gave, um, there's another part. So, like, most people think about like heartbreak around like relationships, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's yeah. that's what I was thinking when you're sharing your story. But heartbreak comes in many different ways, as in your story was somewhat heartbroken based off the abandonment around like your family members and things like that that transpired and carried into your adulthood and adult life yeah can, can you talk a little bit about being someone that was heartbroken and seeing the effects of relationships that you've been in and the heartbrokenness from that what lessons did you learn based off of your experience and then the domino effect of the people that you hurt what was their heartbrokenness like as you saw saw what unfolded for them too as well yeah so like i like i touched on earlier right that abandonment that i dealt with my whole life i formed a protection around myself to never be abandoned again 
by forming that protection, I ultimately created my greatest fear and abandonment in the truest form showed up where everybody left. Right. So you have to learn, you know, it's essentially like it's essentially the law of polarity, just meaning you can't have dark without night. You can't have good without bad. Right. True. So whatever things you experienced, like me, it was abandonment. The law of polarity is always at work. So that abandonment was there to remind me of the opposite, which is I'm never alone. I always have myself and I can do great things with myself. But again, you don't realize that as you're going going through it, right? And you probably don't realize it as I'm as I'm telling you this, right? So if you don't realize the law of polarity, it keeps piling on. You keep packing it in your luggage and you carry that luggage with you, right? And eventually luggage gets so full, it breaks and all your right. stuff falls out, right? And what happens is other people try to help you clean up your luggage. <laughs> and now you're just putting stuff in their luggage. Yeah. Like said, so now all you're doing is, is passing it on, right? The last thing I wanted to feel was abandoned. How do you think my girlfriend felt? How do you think my family felt? They felt like I abandoned them. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. What did I create at the end of the day? Abandonment. So whatever your greatest fear, trauma, trigger is right now, is the exact your gift is the exact opposite. So people have triggers around a lot of things, right? All that is is a compass on to what needs healed. So you can break essentially the generational curse. Definitely. So Derek, how, how does one live life at like the highest level? So you've, you've obviously have developed a path, developed a blueprint in regards to getting past this particular phase in your life to now living at a high level. Mm -hmm. How does one get to that level such as yourself? Yeah. To get to that level starts with extreme ownership. It sounds simple, but very few people have it. And extreme ownership means you know exactly who you are. You know what atmosphere you bring to this world. Now, it's difficult because, right, we think we have ownership of our life. And let's say we woke up tomorrow and your partner left you. Do you still know who you are? Do you still yeah. live the same path, right? Let's say tomorrow you were fired from your amazing career. Do you still know who you are, right? Like with my with my um, coaching clients, the question I ask them is, who are you? And they immediately start saying, well, I'm a mother. Well, I'm a great father. I'm a brother. You know, I'm a great employee. Those are all attachments. Who are you if you woke up and everything was stripped away from you tomorrow? Would you start talking negative about yourself just because you don't have those things? Or do you still know who you are and you're still going to operate the same way? So once you know who you are without those attachments, life gradually and positively unfolds for you. Because remember, extreme ownership means you know that you control what goes on in your life, all the good and all the bad. So if you wake up knowing every day how much power you have, you start acting and thinking differently. And ultimately, that's you in your truest, highest level form. Absolutely, man. I think whenever we, we want to live in our true, authentic self, man, awareness and identity is so much, so much, so much aligned, man. Yeah. When, when, uh, when I think about my transformational growth and I had to learn how to leave a lot of things in the past and change. Mm -hmm. And I adopted a whole bunch of new things in my life. And you talked about it earlier. And I wanted you to touch on how important is it when you began your journey was your new network, your accountability partners, your mentors, your mm -hmm. coaches, whoever, all those things that I know that I, I, I uh, employed in my life. Can you talk yeah, a little yeah. bit about if you want to talk about who some of those people were and how important 
was it for you to go on this self-discovery journey to changing your life and doing some of these things? Yeah. Yeah. So essentially it started with a spiritual mentor. I had to heal my spirit. I didn't even figure out if I even had a spirit, right? Mm -hmm. So I started with a spiritual mentor to, you know, let me know how forgiveness of self works and how, you know, I'm not the only one in this world to do the things that I've done. All right. Once I got to that point, I attached myself to a mentor in a, in a life coach, somebody that had gone on the same journey that I was trying to go on. Somebody that had made it to the other side, right? Cause the therapist, the typical therapists and counselors with their degrees weren't cutting it. Right. I needed somebody that had been there and made it to the other side to guide me. Right. And that's how I started creating the game plan of rebuilding myself, rebuilding my identity, rebuilding my life. So you have to have a new network that also meant I can't have certain people in my life, certain people that want to essentially bring up the past at any mm -hmm. given time important. or it's anybody important. that sees me as that same person. Right. So right. I literally, I had to reconstruct my, my environment, day-to-day environment or people that I still had guilt and shame around. I could no longer be around. Right. Because that caused triggers in me. And it also, I had, had to start learning people in public i cannot control people's opinions actions i cannot control so even if they do say something that's hurtful to me it's my decision if i go into depression and spiral and self-medicate or if i continue on the path that i'm on so attaching to somebody that's been on the the specific journey that you've been on I think is the most crucial because there's people like you, there's people like me. Right. And the biggest part is like I said before, speaking up, reaching, reaching out because there was times where I couldn't even get off my couch because I had so much social anxiety and just petrified to be, be in public to now, obviously, being super transparent about my whole whole journey so it's just that it's a journey man you got there's people out there that have done what you've done all the bad things and there's people that have achieved what it is that you want to achieve you align yourself with those people and you let them lead lead the way like i tell my i'm not i'm not here to tell them what to do i'm just here to shine the flashlight on where they want to go definitely Something important I've noticed is you've within that blueprint that you've created for yourself, mm -hmm. you started setting personal goals. Yeah. And I see that you was like, this is the next level, the next level, the next level. And you just kept knocking it out, knocking it out. If you want to play like a video game, however you want to, but you just kept knocking out these goals, man. And I remember when I was in business working for other companies and things like that, how we used to create like smart goals and making goals attainable and things like that. If you could talk about how important goal setting was for you and for our listeners, some things that they should incorporate when they're setting their goals for themselves too as well. Yeah. Like self-improvement goals. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, dude, I'll tell you exactly how, how mine started. Like you said, it's incremental goals. Yeah. Right? There's an end goal, but certain things have to happen to get to that. Right. End. Right. Right. So literally my mentor to get me off the couch was like, go walk outside for 10 minutes, mm. come back in. And that was a lot for me. And then he's like, take your dog downtown for a walk for 30 minutes. Now there's people, which was even scarier. Okay. We knocked that out. Okay. Now go take yourself to lunch to a restaurant, right? And then we accomplish that. But you have to realize, like some of those steps, I didn't complete the first time, right? I tried to take myself to lunch. Somebody came and talked to me. I automatically assumed they were there to 
talked crap about me and I freaked out and had to go home and ruin the rest of my weekend. Right. But you, you keep going. So it doesn't matter. Just start small, right? Wake up tomorrow and read one positive affirmation. That's a win. That's a win. Start at zero. That's a win, right? Wake up tomorrow and journal three things that you're grateful for, right? That's a win, right? There's no right or wrong when it comes to the goal setting if it's moving you forward, mm -hmm. right? It might be today you didn't cry. That's a win, right? But if you have this game plan, it's easier to accomplish the goals if you have those steps. Because if I'm just sitting over here, you know, medicated on my couch and like, I want to be on a podcast one day telling my story, that sounds impossible to me, right? I'd be like, there's no way. Like, where do I even begin, right? But if I start those small steps, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Okay. Now I'm good in public and I can talk about my story to certain people. You know, there, there's a process and you set goals. That's why it's so key to have a, a mentor or a coach to help help you along. Because it's not it's not always linear. It's up. It's up and down, especially with mental health. I think. When it comes to goal setting, man, and. The process the incremental process that you uh, mentioned. As much as you go on that, yes, there could be mess ups and screw ups and things like that. But as you continuously do it, it seems like there is a level of self confidence that comes with that. Yeah. And 100% um, once developing self confidence and knowing that you could do it and you could accomplish it, I think it's good for yourself. And also think it's important when you're now aligning yourself with like-minded people that are cheering for you. You know what I'm saying? So that's when I like when you said like, all right, that's when I got a mentor. That's when I got a coach because mm -hmm. now you got people in your corner that's rooting for you and not bashing you and not waiting for you to fail and waiting for you to pick on you and say, I knew he wouldn't make it that those yeah, types of yeah. people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think and that's, that's, the, really that's the environment I tried to try to create with the, with the blueprint. You don't gotta be perfect. You're going to mess up. I'm a mess up, but if we keep you going, like you said, you build self-confidence with self-confidence comes self-trust true with self-trust changes, starts changing your thought patterns. Thought patterns is what changes your actions. And then your actions is what creates new outcomes for your life. Definitely, man. So Derek, I've listened to your story. You're a man that has led a true life of transformation, bro. Thank you. How important is it now for you when it comes to taking care of Derek with uh, self-care, self-love, self-healing, and all of these things just to maintain that positive mindset, that positive professional growth, uh, personal growth for yourself, man? How important is that for you? I mean, essentially, it's the number one thing. It's the number one thing because without self-care, I can't live my life at its highest form. Without me prioritizing my self-care, I can't show up in my most powerful version for everyone around me and everyone that I, that I care for. My self-care is what keeps me rooted and centered in the person I was designed to be when I was put on this earth. When I don't take self-care is when things start to fall astray. You, you mentioned earlier in this podcast that you were one person when the camera was out mm -hmm. and you was another person at home. Yeah. Looking back, to where you started from to where you're at now man and now you are that one person centered anchored yeah, yeah. rooted that's right sir. inside and outside wherever you go social media in front of the camera in front of the tv with um your significant other with your family what does that feel like man to see the journey and to look back all the stuff that you just talked about right 
to see it and talk about it now, man. Man, it literally, it, I mean, it literally feels, I know it's cliche, but like the weight is off. So I know everybody in my life right now that that is around me, they're getting, number one, they're getting my best version of myself that I've ever lived. True enough. Number two, they actually enjoy the person that I am. They don't care what my body fat is. They don't care how many photos, they don't care how many clients I have. They don't care when my next photo shoot is, right? They're literally just enjoying Derek. And I, for a long time, I didn't even know what that looked like. I didn't even probably think that was possible. So now it's just, you know, like I said, it's literally like the weight has lifted because I don't have the stress of trying to live up to something that I'm not. I'm not a model anymore, right? I don't do those things anymore now if you want to partake in my life love to have you and if you don't that's fine too but if you're there i know there's there's what you see is what you get at this point and that includes owning my downfalls 100 man so we spoke a good bit man about your story and i, I always ask everyone that comes on the show and i think it's extremely important to share with us your journey. But now for our listeners that have dealt with someone that may have been a narcissist type of person, for our listeners that may find themselves in your shoe that you had in the past, what are some words of encouragement? What are some life lessons that you could uh, leave with our audience that they could uh, take away um, based off your story? Yeah. So no matter what side you're on, as I mentioned, you've done the best that you can to your ability with the knowledge and tools you've had up to this point. So give yourself some grace. The second part is from this moment on, you can change the direction of your life. And that goes from both sides. No matter what you've done up to this point, you have the ability, just like you had the ability to create that life up to this point. From this point on, you have the same power to create whatever life it is that you desire, no matter what side of a relationship you're on. So let that be inspiring, right? Because a lot of people, they, they dwell on, man, I did A, B, or C, or man, I was in this terrible relationship. That All that is is energy. You can sure. use that same energy to benefit yourself and create whatever it is that you desire. So allow yourself grace and start to feel a little excitement that you can literally create whatever it is you want from here on out. And thank you for leaving us with that gem, brother. As we get ready to wrap up, man, um, I want to thank you for being on the podcast and sharing your story, being totally transparent and to being totally vulnerable. And I, yes, and I say that, man, and total authenticity, brother, because like I told you, man, I, I heard I hear this story a lot from women, but I've never really heard it from a man's perspective. Yeah. And for you to come on here and share your story, I know that it's going to help so, 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 so many people and impact so many people, man. Uh, yeah, that's, so, that's the goal. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate that sincerely. Man, thank you for that, brother. Thank you. So if anybody wanted to sign up for your coaching program, um, ask you to come on a podcast, do a speaking engagement, or find out more about you. How can they get a hold of you? How can they contact you? And how could they work? Yeah. So the best way to get a hold of me is I keep it super personal and super organic is just send me a DM on Instagram and have a personal conversation. That way you don't get lost in emails and all that stuff. So if you um, DM me on Instagram at dnewborn, We'll have a personal conversation, whether you're reaching out for help or whatever it may be. If you just want to graze through some information, you can go to newbornblueprint.com or DerekNewborn.com. But if you want to connect or you're looking for help or just need a voice, send me a DM at dnewborn on Instagram. Absolutely. Well, Derek, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being a guest, man, on the show. You're welcome to come back anytime, share a story. 
you got a book coming out or something like that, let us know. I think if you was to put out a book, I'm the first one to tell you that I think it would be probably a bestseller to talk I about. Appreciate it, man. <laughs> I, appreciate, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for uh, having me. It means a lot. I'm proud to be yeah. here, man. Thank you so much, man. Um, until next time, guys, we drop episodes weekly. Um, we love you. Peace for myself and Derek. Next time, we out of here. See you. Peace. Can't complain at all Couple dollars in my pocket No income and go Been working on my body Getting healthier Thank God for clarity